This is the real wild kingdom of the birds and the beasts. And the fish are everywhere too. Here, the mighty life-sustaining Volga River meets the glistening waters of the Caspian Sea, forming the biggest river delta in Europe. Here, nature made something unique. In this vast area, she orchestrated a grand performance, and every creature plays a part. But it's not an easy performance to behold, and much of it goes on behind the scenes, hidden from men who try to destroy the fragile canvas of this gorgeous and intricate work of art. Here, we will try to draw back the curtain and watch the most fascinating parts of this endless performance without breaking the action or disturbing the players. Behind the scenes of the Volga Delta. This avian paradise didn't happen all at once. Over the last several thousand years, the Caspian Sea's level changed. The sea receded and the river brought so much water that the riverbed couldn't absorb it all. The water started to fill the hollows and spread out into numerous streams and brooks. So, thanks to the life-giving Caspian, a vital oasis appeared amid the dry steppes and sandy dunes. The delta's geographic position influences its climate. It's usually warm and continental. In the summer heat, this semi-arid region turns the temperature up to 45 degrees centigrade. But in the winter, the temperature may fall to minus 25. When we came to the Damchik cluster of the Astrakhan Nature Reserve, the temperature was minus 15. There was a heavy snow the day before, which is a rare thing here. Usually people get around on the frozen channels by scooter, but not this time. The deep snows became a real obstacle on our way to the low delta. There, on the spots that hadn't frozen solid, we could see the birds that winter here. But we still hope to reach our goal. We needed to fix up a snowmobile that was suitable for these conditions. While waiting for some repairs, we decided to explore the underwater world of the delta. Kirill Litvinov, an ichthyologist from the Astrakhan Reserve, helped us out. He's created a 3D model of the riverbed that shows where the catfish hibernate. Пошла, 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 пошла
The ice in the delta is about 20 centimeters thick. It's not easy to cut a hole into it, let alone one that's big enough and properly positioned. The water's current, visibility, the presence of decaying trees or logs, everything must be considered so as not to get into trouble. Catfish hibernate in the late autumn. They gather in deep hollows where there's no current and stay there until spring. Sometimes these hollows can contain hundreds of fish. It took about 40 minutes to explore the whole area. Unfortunately, our hopes of seeing big catfish gathering on the bottom didn't come true. For some reason, they must have left this place, or maybe just didn't come here this year. Now, it's a task for ichthyologists to understand what happened and why. Unlike the catfish, other delta inhabitants stay busy all winter long, searching for food. One is the white-tailed eagle. In the Volga Delta, you can find one of the world's biggest populations of this endangered bird. There are about 150 breeding pairs. This year-round resident of the delta knows its role well. When the cold comes, it's difficult to catch fish, the eagle's favorite food. Instead, the whitetail looks for weak, wounded, or dead animals for sustenance. It also has its own way of hunting. When the predator notices birds on the water, it scares them to determine the weakest one. But the dapper ducks dive well, and they're not easy to catch. That's why the eagle watches the bird's movement underwater and tries to catch them when they come up. Most of the winter, though, it's forced to scavenge for food. From the reserve's main building to the delta's mouth, it's about 15 kilometers. Getting there by snowmobile isn't a problem anymore. The low delta landscape is different. There are many small inlets and islands of reeds among the ice. Shallow water, free of the ice, attracts hundreds of birds searching for food. On the nature reserve, the birds feel safe. They can find enough food and the cold doesn't bother them. Winter on the Volga Delta doesn't last long. Soon, the spring bloom will come and a new cast of characters with new roles and storylines will come with them to the region.
The most highly anticipated event of the spring is the annual flood. Nowadays, the process is controlled by dams and reservoirs. When the floodgates open, millions of liters of water that had been trapped as ice will come cascading down. The power of the spring torrent fills all the arteries of the broad delta and the ecosystem rejuvenates itself. Life on the Volga Delta begins anew. Water is everywhere now. The steppe's roads become rivers. And green meadows turn into huge lakes. These fox pups, though, could be in for some trouble. Now they're playing, carefree, waiting for their parents to return. But if the flood is strong and the water comes close, they'll have to move on and find shelter. Groves of willows start to spread out along the flooded streams and channels. Now, their roots absorb more water than the plant can evaporate through its leaves. The excess humidity is literally squeezed from the pores of numerous branches. That could be why the willows are called weeping. The great spotted woodpecker makes its nest in the willow thickets. The soft and pliable wood is perfect for building a cozy home. The male of the species picks the spot for the nest. It can't be too rotten or too moist. Each breeding pair establishes its own territory for feeding and foraging that it defends from other woodpeckers. This feeding ground can be as big as 15 hectares. At the beginning of May, the hollow is usually ready and the birds can start laying eggs. This time though, it's the male who sits on the eggs, keeping them warm, especially at night. The female usually sleeps clinging to the wall of the nest. The old nesting sites never stay empty for long. The starlings that come to the delta in early March will take up residence there without hesitation. And they are real artists. The starling can skillfully imitate other voices and sounds. But at times, this restless singer tries to sing all the parts at once, resulting in only chirps and whistles. When the chicks hatch, the parents fly for food up to 10 times per day, exerting much effort in the process. The rapidly growing chicks beg for food all the time and are ready to swallow even big insects whole. Also in the hollow, close to this noisy neighbor, is the bustling and trustful willow biter. Only the female sits on the eggs while the male is busy finding and bringing food for her and the chicks.
A close relative of the willow biter is the pendolin tit, and he's not content to use an old nest. Each year, he builds a new one. This skillful builder isn't afraid of an architectural challenge. He's ready to work all day long. And in the bird world, his home will be the most original. The Volga's avian kingdom is the lower delta, but to visit this vast area, you need an experienced guide. It's easy to lose your way in the complex web of streams and tributaries. Even a detailed map won't help much. There are no signposts or markers, and all the waterways look similar. It's almost like a labyrinth among the dense reeds that can grow up to six meters high. The low delta appears suddenly. Vast areas of water are strikingly large, but only about a meter and a half deep. Many islands of reeds and bays are ideal for birds that migrate back from wintering grounds. One of the first to arrive in the delta are mute swans. They start making their nests in April. The mute swan is different from other swans. It's very big and beautiful. No other bird arches its neck with such grace or raises its wings with such elegance. But the voice of the mute swan is weak and hoarse. When the bird is annoyed, it can only hiss threateningly. When it comes time to settle down, the male brings the construction material and the female swan builds the nest. Normally, nests are built among the reeds thickets, but sometimes they're found in open areas. The male swan guards its territory throughout the nesting season. Passing the boundary into his domain isn't wise. The birds are strong. A blow from his wing could kill a fox or even break a man's arm. The bond between a pair of swans is very strong, lifelong in fact. They can live up to 40 years, long enough to celebrate a pearl wedding anniversary. Pelicans, on the other hand, are only together for a season. They used to be common in Russia, but now they're listed as endangered. In the Volga Delta, there are about 300 breeding pairs, and their numbers are thought to be growing. But the pelicans get the prize for claiming the best turf. Even the swans can't put up a fight for long, and eventually surrender their land to the pelican.
Not far from the low delta, the pelican's closest relative lives among the spreading willows. This is the cormorant. The Astrakhan Reserve has Russia's biggest cormorant colony. Experts count about 10,000 nests among the reeds. Nesting cormorants arrive in pairs. Their union, like the swans, is lifelong. Both parents take turns hatching and feeding the chicks. Cormorants eat only fish. To feed their voracious hatchlings, the parents go fishing up to five times a day. They return with a packed stomach for their young. Because they get so much food, the chicks grow very fast. They can become independent in 12 to 13 weeks. The cormorant colony is a noisy place in the delta, but it's not the only one. The anxious cries of terns spread far around the waters of the low delta. They're also interested in fish. They hover above water, looking for schools of small fish and dive in to catch them. They almost never miss. But hunger isn't the only reason the terns strike from above. It's their mating season, and the fish are an obligatory wedding gift. With a present like this, the male demonstrates his affection and shows his serious intentions. The most pivotal acts of the spring performance, though, happen under the surface. The delta, flush with fresh water, is an excellent spawning ground for the Volga's many fish. Filled with roe, they arrive in the flooded meadows. Usually this is grazing land for cows. But now these warm waters, rich with plankton, are the best place for the fry to develop. The waterlogged fields are teeming with life. Crucian carp, Caspian roach, and perch spawn in the tall grasses in huge numbers. Beautiful yellow-sided breams swim among the plants. Perhaps the most visible and remarkable spawning is that of the European carp. These bronze giants don't swim, but rather creep along the dense vegetation. Several males will follow a female who's ready to spawn. Their humpbacks are easy to see, and they fight for their mate with such ferocity that the water can look like it's boiling. In these floodplains, the birds can have a proper feast. Here, everyone can find the right-sized fish.
snakes are also happy to hunt the fish. No poisonous snakes live in the delta, only harmless grass and whip snakes. It's not tough for the fast reptile to catch a fish during the spawning season. Eating the prey, though, can take some time. It can take a while for the snake to digest such a hearty meal. And it can be several days before he'll need to hunt again. Much of the delta ecosystem depends on how the spawning goes. Most of the area's predators eat nothing but fish. During this period, the Nature Reserve staff monitors the marine populations carefully. They determine when the different species start spawning, how long the spawning lasts, and the number of sick or weakened fish that result. This important work has been going on for more than 50 years. The collected data helps researchers identify environmental changes and understand their effects on the fish populations of the delta. By the end of the summer, the flooding also ends. The grown fry leave their warm, shallow bays and follow the subsiding water into the deep streams. There, they'll be put to their first real test. These waters are full of predators, the most dangerous being the pike. It's a very efficient hunter with an elastic stomach that can hold very big prey. The pike are such voracious feeders, even their own relatives aren't safe from their appetites. The underwater world of the summertime delta is amazingly diverse. The shallow parts of the low delta have dense thickets of underwater plants. Warm water, abundant food, and lush vegetation attract numerous Volga fish, and it's their time to graze. The common rud is one of the most beautiful fish here. It's agile and careful and nearly impossible to catch in a net. The rud feeds on the smooth shoots of water plants, insects, and their larvae. The catfish is the biggest predator of the delta. In the late 1930s, commercial fishing crews caught giant catfish, weighing up to 300 kilograms and growing up to five meters long. Today, though, no one finds catfish that big. The king of the delta fish, though, is the European carp. He got this title for his cunning, power, and grandiose appearance. The carp is a placid fish, Careful, but curious. If you don't move, he may even swim right up to you.
all this underwater life is very interesting for the great white heron. The bird may stay still for a long time in one position, waiting for its meal. It may seem strange, but this tactic actually brings it more food than if it actively searches for prey. The gray heron also uses the same method of hunting. It's a very silent and uncommunicative bird, and it prefers to hunt solo. There are several species of herons in the Volga Delta. They differ not only by their appearance, but also their behavior. The small white heron is more active. It likes to sing out and isn't as careful a hunter as the great white or gray heron. Because of its small size, it feeds in the shallow parts of the delta. The small white heron doesn't wait for prey to come close, but actively chases after it. It has another interesting way of hunting, too, stirring up the silty water with its bright legs to startle and catch the small fry. But this method of hunting seems more fun than the way the Delta's biggest fish eater goes about it. Twice a day, in the morning and afternoon, lines of great black birds soar above the water. This is a flight of cormorants carrying out their collective fishing. They fly in groups of 40 to 50 birds and start their grand hunt. They circle their chosen school of fish and flap their wings to drive the frightened prey in the right direction. It's not merely feeding, it's a real feast. the cormorants won't stop until their bellies are full. But this happens fairly fast. Cormorants with full stomachs fly away to digest their food and dry their feathers. Then the low delta gets calm and silent once again. Sometimes, though, something can ruffle the bird's collective feathers. 
this white-tailed eagle decided to get some rest nearby. But the master of this land is happy with fish and isn't interested in other birds, so they have nothing to fear from him. Summer is the best time for the birds. Their chicks are grown and some of them can fly by themselves. They have fewer cares and they can feed from the warm water rich with plants, insects, and larvae. They have to store up energy before the cold comes and they fly south for the winter. While eating the delicious plants, the parents attentively look after their chicks, but the little ones always try to show their independence, swimming further and further ahead, heedless of any danger. Such carelessness is forgivable for these young, but the mistake that was made by one adult gray goose could cost them their lives in other circumstances. The geese are very careful birds. They notice any movement and will fly away at once. There is little chance to approach the geese and hide without them noticing the camera's lens. It can happen though. Here, a goose, without any suspicion, happily wandered about six meters from our camera for about two minutes. It's rare that a bird this attentive and careful would make such a mistake. Finally, he notices though, and flees. As they say, all's well that ends well. Some birds, however, get used to the video lenses quickly. For instance, these black-winged stilts. These birds feed in bays with open banks. With their long, thin bills, they easily catch tadpoles, water bugs, and beetles. On dry land, it's more difficult. In order to eat or rest, they have to fold their stilt-like legs. A glossy ibis feeds nearby. This bird is always fashionably dressed with its brown metallic plumage. Its diet is nearly the same as the black winged stilts, but it finds food by touch. Its long bill is very sensitive. When the bird dips it into the river bottom vegetation where its food is hidden, it can feel any movement and instantly react. But searching for food isn't this bird's only concern. They're also quite serious about their appearance. In summer, most of the birds molt. They shed their old and dingy feathers and beautiful new plumage appears. This is a very important time for the birds. The long and difficult flight to warmer climes is ahead. The white-tailed eagle is in no hurry though. The delta is his home 
and he doesn't need any other. The Volga Delta is a hospitable home, though. Here, in secret spaces, everybody who needs rest and food can find adequate shelter. In summer, this house is specially decorated with different vegetation. The calm waters of the low delta resemble a motley patchwork quilt weaved from numerous water plants. Terns use this dense, multicolored cover for nesting. They hatch later than others and only nest in midsummer. Probably the most gorgeous and amazing plant in the delta is the lotus. The Volga Delta is the northernmost place on Earth where this ancient and mysterious plant grows. People through the centuries have used the lotus as a valuable food and medical resource. In some southeastern countries, the lotus is even considered sacred. one can see the symbolism in the plant's very structure. Its roots are in the underwater soil. Its stem grows upward toward the open air. Its flower is the crown on top, looking to the sun, the embodiment of transformation and purity. The lotus has an amazing quality. It's always clean. Its leaves are covered with a thin layer of wax. This microscopic film keeps dirt from sticking to the leaf and debris drifts away easily. Above, the lotus leaves are very big and can reach 70 centimeters in diameter. The air channels underneath the leaves keep the plant from collecting too much moisture. The lotus has always been known for its unrivaled beauty. They have a faint but pleasant smell like cinnamon the lotus blossom, though, is very short-lived, blooming for just three days. Fortunately, each plant has a number of flowers that bloom in turn. That's why it's possible to admire the blossoms until the end of summer. With the arrival of autumn, the delta's appearance changes. It rains more frequently and the cold wind starts blowing. The silty soil and sandy spits are exposed and the reeds turn yellow. Lotus thickets are hard to recognize now. The leaves have dried up and sway in the breeze. Dry pods full of seeds are spread around by the weak current. The water gets cold very fast, and there is less and less food. Many of the birds have already flown south. But that doesn't mean there are fewer birds on the low delta. 
behind the scenes, life still flows. In the autumn, the Volga Delta becomes a great intersection for the migratory routes of many types of waterfowl. Now, all of them try to gather as much energy as possible. The ever active flock of gulls has been replenished with young birds and, together with the herons, chase the rare schools of fish that have not yet settled into the deep, calm shallows. The cormorants are still here, too, but they are gathered in flocks. With the first frost, though, the entire fleet of these black birds will depart in a single day for their winter ground in Azerbaijan. Nearby, on a sandy spit, a flock of pelicans has settled. Because of their singular appearance and odd strut, the locals call these birds Baba, a polite way of saying respected elders. Clumsy on land, the pelicans fly gracefully. You can spend a long time watching them soar, supporting their heavy bodies with their mighty wings. For birds, autumn is their travel season. But as some depart for sunnier climates, others are just arriving. Numerous guests from the north make stops here for rest and food on their way to other wintering grounds. The long-awaited white cranes appear on the sandbars. They're rare guests with few species remaining in the wild. They nest far north on the upper Ob River. Their wintering grounds are in Iran and India. In the Volga Delta, they prefer this part of the Astrakhan Nature Reserve and feel very comfortable here. Every day, new flights of birds come to the Delta. In the second part of October, the first flocks of whooper swans arrive. Tens of thousands of these birds gather in the Delta's protected lands. The difference between mute swans and whooper swans is their clear and melodious voices. This may be the origin of the term swan song. The swans gather on the shallow waters. Here, they feel safe, and they can still find food among the silt. The adults eat roots and smooth water plants. Young ones prefer more calorie-rich foods, like small fish and insects. Sometimes disputes for the feeding grounds turn into real fights. The young imitate adults and learn to defend their territory. Usually, families try to get far apart from each other. Strict parents keep their chicks from communicating with their peers from other families. Juveniles may create their own families in three years when they grow their new white plumage. Before that, they'll stick to this modest gray costume. Hunting for food, the young don't forget to train their wings for the long journey south. 
Sometimes, though, birds stay in the delta until it's quite cold to collect more energy for their arduous flight. The seasons change. Soon, the first frosts will come and the vast delta region will again be covered in a layer of ice and fluffy snow. The last flights of birds will leave the formerly hospitable delta waters. The stage will draw silent, but fortunately, not forever. Each year, a grand performance amid nature's scenery happens in the Volga Delta. It has terrific actors and elaborate plots. Here, every role is a starring one. Everything is interconnected and proceeds according to the majestic will of an invisible director. Entrance to this performance is free, but the backstage passes are only there for those who are ready to listen and follow this grand design. Those who can feel, understand, and help save the living world around us.